there's so much I want. I'm like, oh, I must have that. And I'm like, oh, God, that was amazing. And look at these chicken wings. <laughs> So happy new year to everyone. It is almost the end of 2018. It has been a pretty awesome year. We started off in America and we've ended up in Spain. And now we're in <laughs> Australia and so it's been crazy. So yeah. we thought that as we come to the end of what's been a phenomenal year for us sailing wise, mm. we'd go through the highlights, the lowlights, the some middle bit lights and talk about what we've done. So what we did, we went to Patreon, we said to our patrons, what do you want to ask? What do you want to know? What do you want us to talk about? And these are the questions. Okay, so question one. What's question one, Teresa? Okay, question one is from Shane Creek. Um, he's got a few questions, actually. I would say that Shane Creek. Shane Creek. Shane Creek should start making wine. <laughs> Yeah, an excellent name for a wine label. Um, okay, how many miles did we do this season? I reckon 5,000. So no time like the present to actually work out how many miles we did. We started in South Carolina, took the boat all the way to the Bahamas. That's about 500 miles. After a month in the Bahamas, we headed off to Bermuda. Bermuda, 750 miles. Now Bermuda to Portugal, that's the big one. That I think for us was about 3,000 miles. So we had 2,000 to the Azores and then another 1,000. So yeah, let's call that 3,000 miles. And then finally from our stop in Portugal to Valencia in Spain, and obviously this is not overland, we went around the coast, another 600 miles. So let's add that up. How many miles did we do this season? <laughs> the, uh, maths. <laughs> yeah, five. We'll link it down below. Five thousand. That's not a good question. We'll add it up and, oh, yeah. and, and put it down. Yeah, yeah. that's what we reckon. Okay, uh, when will we be back in the water? Uh, whose question is that? This Therese? is still Shane's. Shane's. Shane's got multiple questions. He has okay. multiple questions, um, we which is fine. We plan to be back in the water in March. And what's our favourite location this season? Bermuda. Yeah. I, I love Bermuda. I, Tell me. I think for me, my favourite location was um, probably Alvo in Portugal. Oh, that yeah. was really special. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like a kind of hungry man at an all you can eat buffet when it comes to questions like this. There's so much I want. I'm like, oh, I must have that. And I'm like, oh, God, that was amazing. And look at these chicken wings. <laughs> but yeah, Alvo was amazing. Parts of Portugal were amazing. Bermuda has been, was fantastic. Yeah. And like places like Hope Town in the Abacos. Yeah. yeah but, you know, I really love those places. So yeah, yeah. no one favourite, but lots of specific favourites. There you go. Yes. Uh, what was the biggest repair of the season? The biggest repair for us was the jib. Yeah. Um, we, our jib, we had um, a problem with our jib. Um, it kind of split mid-Atlantic. And so we were kind of on the four deck like, repairing the jib. Uh, and that's, we've ordered a new jib. So that's, uh, that's where we're going with that. Yeah. Uh, um, what is your I don't think we've got the answer to this, but it's a good question. Uh, what is the total cost of sailing this season? Oh, uh, I don't know. I would. We're really we're not one of those sailing channels that are really good at tracking their costs. Like some people have like spreadsheets and like they put down every single penny they spend. We're really not very good at that. Yeah. As long as our bank balance isn't going down too much, we're kind of okay. I mean, touch wood. Well, I th actually, what I would say is, I think the biggest. Is it, what is the precise question? Total, I, total cost of our sailing season. I think the, the, okay, the big costs of our season were expenses related to equipment we bought for the YouTube channel, if, yeah. if that's an answer. So yeah. things like drones, we had to buy a lot of camera equipment. Yeah. And again, that, so that's where, that's where it's come from. Touch wood, no huge expenses with a boat, new, new sails. New sails. New sails, definitely yeah. the biggest for us. Yeah, although there, there's probably more. In, coming you know, into next season. Coming into next season. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest? These are really good questions, Shane. Oh my god! What's the biggest mistake that we made this season? Um, for me, it was not understanding the sea state coming off the Florida coast. 
Oh um, yeah, I wasn't there for that. Yeah, so going into the St. Augustine Inlet and literally getting ourselves boxed into a situation where we couldn't go north, we couldn't go south, we couldn't go west and we had to go east. Or we could have gone south, but either way, we kind of, it was like a really bad chess game. Yeah. Um, we just, for many reasons that I've discussed and discussed at length, um, which I'm happy to discuss again, um, I made decisions as a skipper that were poor decisions. So that, that thought was completely They were mine. kind of to do with the weather, really, wasn't they, mainly? It, it was more to do with, put it this way, and I, I always say that when it comes to decision making, I'm the skipper, it's my fault. It's completely my fault. Really, I would not have gone in front of that weather system. I wouldn't have set sail if, if it had been you and I. Uh, and why is that? Well, we had, I had, well, China was, China was with me. China yeah. crew and China had specific dates and I was uncomfortable about leaving. And I'm like, no, we let him down once. Let's do it again. Let's not do that again. Mm. And that decision, I got, I got my ass handed to me. Yeah. And, and it, it turned out well. But only because of the kindness of strangers. Yeah, the kindness of strangers, and you know, but yeah, I, n not not again. Yeah, uh, I don't I think I've made any mistakes this season. <laughs> You've been practically perfect in every way, Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Okay, I made some dodgy loaves of bread. Does that count? Uh, not really. Not in the scheme of things. <laughs> Mike Henson asks. Um, if we could talk about the tensions inherent in long passages, um, like when we were crossing the Atlantic. Um, you guys have tons of miles under your keel, but still the rough passages seemed tough. I have actually learned from your sister. Hi Kelly! <laughs> <laughs> Hope you're paying attention right now. Your sister, who I would be probably fair to say, occasionally gets a little bit grumpy. Ah. Sometimes, just with us. I but think. what your sister says is she has this mantra in her head that says, "It's only you that's in a mood here," and I've taken that on board. Yeah. So it, it is a question of understanding that when you are tired, you make mistakes. That is inherent in human nature. We're not robots, although one day I will be. <laughs> um, and so when people make mistakes, you just breathe and go all right fine we'll work yeah. through it we work through it you've got to work through it i think that through long passages i mean um shiner as crew is he's perfect crew he is literally that we've had people on board that i would consider to be perfect crew uh, he is perfect crew he just you know he, he knows what he's doing he's sensible um he doesn't know the boat as well as we do um and all three of us made little mistakes on that passage. Sure. Um, but you just, when that mistakes happen, you breathe and say, look, we're going to work through this. So, so it's more um, kind of concentrating on how to deal with uh, issues as they arise, you know, and, and that's kind of the challenge rather than it being inherently challenging. I think that the sleep deprivation and just the general stress of those kind of long passages, it's okay, you can deal with it perfectly all right when everything's going right and everything's fine. Um, but then when things are going wrong or people make mistakes, then you have to really check yourself and like make, make sure that you're reacting in a measured and yeah. proportionate way well, and not getting really upset or really angry unnecessarily because you're tired and stressed. Well, I think as skipper, you know, it's very easy to understand how you don't go, you don't leave dock for a long passage with a dodgy water maker. You don't leave the pass, you don't leave yeah. with a dodgy half tank of water mm -hmm. or you don't think oh you know is that is that shroud okay you don't leave the mm -hmm. dock with crew that you're uncertain about because realistically speaking i'd rather have a dodgy water maker than dodgy crew um i'd rather have no crew at all than dodgy crew oh no water yeah so really I, I, there are so many horror stories we hear firsthand it's not these anecdotal stuff that you're on the internet mm -hmm. about poor crew making conditions dangerous at the, at, you know at the least and uh, you know fatal at worst yeah so yeah so the tensions are to do with your choice of crew I think that um, I think we should really kind of like maybe we'll do an episode actually on crew dynamics without offending anyone because really all we're gonna do is talk about the crew that we really have thought were amazing I actually can plug an article I wrote here about crew dynamics. Yeah. I wrote an article about this very subject in um, Yachting World, I think it was published last year, maybe about a year ago. I'll um, link it down below, I'll try and find it if it's available on the internet, and I'll link it down below. Good. Okay. <coughs> Next question. Next question. 
So Rob De Haven asks, what was the one spot you went to after Atlantic Crossing you wished that you had spent more time in and why? So once we got to Europe, where do we wish that we had been able to spend more time? Um, the short answer is Alvor. The longer answer is that I would still be in Alvor given my my pace. Theresa and I have different paces. I would literally spend a season in an anchorage. Yes. I, am, I, am, I am that slow. But I also, I, I do have a different pace. I prefer to move on probably, we've talked about this before, like I like to move on a bit sooner than Nick likes to and, and uh, not only, is that's not just because I'm an impatient person, although there is that, it's because you know like I want to create really exciting content for you guys and we had made, we made like I think two episodes in Alvor and I felt like that was yeah. the limit, like I, you know. Yeah, if you were if up you're to episode 36 <laughs> in Alvor now, you'd be like, yeah. really, can you no, move we, on? We have a YouTube channel to look yeah, yeah, after, right. so no, 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 yeah, yes. we can't spend a whole year in Alvor, although one day, one day maybe, maybe, maybe. maybe. Um, Rob also says something really lovely, which is um, when you took that bus trip inland to Spain and it's talking about our trip to Seville, uh, it was actually a train trip, um, do you plan to do more of that next sailing season? I personally really enjoyed that episode and it made me want to visit Spain. Yeah. Uh, the, the, well, we'll talk a little bit about our next um, season sailing plans in a while, but there's you know not much we can tell you at this point. Um, but I think that, you know, exploring the countries that we're in uh, to perhaps a greater extent that we've done in the past is something that we're really wanting to do. Um, I think that when we were in the Caribbean, what there was to explore were the anchorages and the little towns, like for example, in the Abacos, like Coke Town. You know, that's that's where all the cruises were. That was a cruising destination. And in a lot of places in the Caribbean and the Bahamas, the cru you know, that was basically what there was to see in that in that place. Places like Europe, obviously, there's a coastline, but there's so much inland to explore. So yes, as we come across countries um, that have that to offer, we will definitely be trying to kind of you know not only see those places for ourselves, but to uh, show you guys as well um, what those countries have to offer. Yeah, I agree. Oh, look, I, we, in fact, the last comment that came through on our YouTube channel was something was like someone someone said, "Oh, I really like the way that you actually give the ups and downs of of your life." And I suppose this is an extension of that. We are showing you what we would do naturally. So it's not like we're saying, oh, we're going to do a YouTube channel and then we're going to show you what we think you want to see. You're just following our lives. <laughs> so if we want to spend a year in Alvor, well, that's what you're going to get, although it's boring. But <laughs> when we go to you, we do travel inland. And yeah. realistically, you know, you can pick and choose to watch those episodes. But it's kind of, if, if sailing into Europe or around Europe is something that you want to do, then these are things that you'll probably end up doing anyway. Yeah. You're going to go inland, whereas Teresa is completely great. When you go to Antigua, there's not a lot inside. Everything is coastal, and you can, you know, and you know the Caribbean islands are famous for their snorkeling and their, mm. and you know the the beaches and the nightlife. And we showed you that there. Now we're showing you the kind of like five thousand years of culture in Spain. You're not going to get the kind of amazing snorkeling in no. the Med. It just doesn't exist. Yeah. So the dynamic of what we do will change as we shift locations. Yeah. Um, and Rob also asks uh, how, a really good question, which is how is the sailing community different Caribbean versus Europe so far? And you know, this isn't the first year that we've sailed in Europe, by the way. We spent um, a couple of years uh, before we left kind of permanently. We did two shakedown cruises in France, which were lovely. And then we spent uh, six months cruising down the Atlantic coast of Europe on our way across um, the Atlantic the first time in 2015. So. Uh, yes, we have a little bit of experience cruising around Europe, and I think that the cruising community is quite different. I'm concerned. I'm not going to lie to you. I have some concerns about the season in Europe. Yeah, it's it for, for reasons that I don't know. I don't really understand fully. There just isn't that social aspect that there is in the Caribbean. Um, yeah, we haven't found it yet. It we may haven't exist. found it yet. I think that probably we've not been to the places where there are those kind of cruising communities. Like Greece, I feel there is quite a permanent cruising community there. You know, couples, cruising couples who just are in Greece for years and years and years and end. So perhaps I hope that when and if we end up sailing Greece, we will tap into those communities. Um, I think we're a little bit lucky, well we're very lucky because we have this lovely YouTube channel 
had all your amazing followers and so we have had people contact us since coming to Europe and say you know can I come and see you we're you know on holiday we are we live here we've got our boat you know in that marina and we've actually been quite social yeah. um, however that's I think been because people have kind of tracked us down which we really appreciate well let's let's be positive I think that if we get the boat to Greece this season if that's where our season's plans take us or next season's plans I think we'll find a bigger community yeah. once you get to anchor more yeah I think that's what it is I yeah. think as soon as you're in an anchorage all the boats kind of get together so yeah. that's my take on yeah. it so look forward to that I also think that part of it may be a cultural thing um, a lot of cruises in the Caribbean especially the Bahamas are American and I think that Americans are very very social and uninhibited so whereas like an English couple might want to have sundowners with the boat anchored next door they there's kind of this like I don't know there's something stopping them from just getting in their dinghy and zipping over and inviting the couple next door over in where most it, cases I I'm obviously like, I'm massively generalizing so. well, clearly I'm generalizing but I think that there's definitely a grain of truth here whereas we've found that the American cruises are just far more open you know we've been approached countless times for um, by yeah. fellow cruisers who are American who have you know uh, you know, ask us out to sundowners, to gatherings, to potlucks, and um, that, that really facilitates the social kind of aspect of, of cruising. I That's think something we really enjoyed, like yeah. in the BBIs and in the Bahamas, where there are a lot of American cruisers. If I had to put a statistic on it, I would say of all the times we've been approached by people in anchorages or in the Caribbean to go do something sociable, 95% of them are American. Probably. And then we've approached like a lot of Australians because we see the Australian flag and I get excited. So we've kind of made yeah. We ma but we made a friends. conscious effort to not yeah. be not to not to show any British reserve. That's right. Exactly. There is such a thing as British reserve. Of course there is. Yes. Okay. Now that we've established that. Yes. <laughs> Stephen Medway uh, asks a question um, about our Atlantic crossing. So he says that he was plotting me on Google, pl plotting us, sorry, on G Google Earth and windy.com, and he would like to know um, how we managed to navigate between the doldrums to the south and the storms to the north. Um, do you have satellite internet or a very good and <laughs> polished crystal ball? So we've talked, we actually made a video about um, how we communicate at sea, and a lot of that involves how we get our weather at sea and again I'll link to that just here I hope I'm pointing on the right side I think I'm pointing on the right side um, and that tells uh, that talks in detail about how we get our, our weather forecasts at sea but Nick would you like to just um... well so we, we work on uh, we get grip files from our, our sat phone the sat phone signal then goes into a into a router which then goes to a, you know, a predict wind which is what we use at the moment and essentially because of the way the Atlantic crossing, especially when you are going from uh, west to east, you are in a position where you've got low pressure systems above you and the high pressure system below you, and you literally skirt the line, and you can see uh, quite clearly where that line is. And um, really, you go north if you want wind, and you go south if you don't if you want less wind. And we followed a fairly fairly conservative sailing plan where we weren't tearing the arse out of life and pushing the boat too hard and that's we always do that so we try to kind of look for moderate wind yeah um, in fact there was a point if you look at our passages we're going across the Atlantic we saw this big low swinging in and we literally just I think we went almost due south for a day to escape it yeah and at the time we we're sitting there going is this the right thing to do is it the right thing to do are we gonna just get caught in in a lull and then we found out subsequently that the people that were a lot further north of us got absolutely hammered and that's okay for the kind of there was a lot of real hardcore racer boys uh, and girls out there who were like pushing the pushing it as hard as they can. There are a lot of family cruisers out there that had a very very miserable experience. Well, there were a lot of hardcore racer guys on boats with you know women who were sailing for like the first time and who, quite frankly, they didn't do their wives any favours um, by giving them this really wild ride across the Atlantic yeah, absolutely. and they get to the other side and, and you know us women talk very freely about these kinds of things and um, you know the feedback was well <laughs> I'm not doing that again so and well, I'm, well, sa I'm saying well we had a really nice crossing so well, what I would also say is a lot of amazing hardcore women skippers that take their husbands for the first time just to even it out that it's like a sexist time. well that's true <laughs> well done exactly <laughs> okay Let's move on.
Join us next time for part two of our end of year review where we discuss catamarans, our next boat, what we think of our current boat and many other things as we look back on 2018 season. So don't forget to click that notification bell if you don't want to miss anything and also feel free to subscribe because this channel is fairly awesome.